Good morning. Welcome back to Coffee and Colorful Conversation. So as you can see, I have a special guest with me today. This is something new because I wanted to be able to demonstrate and show you visibly what I'm talking about. I know sometimes when I'm talking really fast about something, you're probably sitting there like, I can kind of picture it, but I can't. I wish I could see her doing it kind of thing. So I wanted to bring my girlfriend here. And this is a common scenario. I know you can relate. Your client comes like this. She's coming from the gym. She has a little ponytail in her hair. Her hair is all pulled back low in the back of her head. And what happens is a lot of us go, oh, hi, how are you? How you doing? So good to see you. How's this? How's that? And then we pull the ponytail out and we go like this and we start to section whatever our go-to sectioning pattern is, is what we end up doing. We start sectioning the hair, we start talking, we start mixing up our lightener and we just start foiling. And what happens is we're, we're always standing up above the head. So our view is up above looking down. And what we're looking at at all times is the very next piece, the very next piece, the very next piece. But here's the trick. And here's something that changed my entire career. I have to give credit where credit is due is Beth Minardi. Many, many years ago at one of her many amazing beauty focus classes, she talked about the power of stepping back away from the head and seeing the head from a totally different perspective. What does that mean? So if I'm up above her, let me lower her a little bit. So she's in my chair. She's about here. And we're having our entire conversation with me up above looking down on her hair. So when I get to this section in the back, I want to just do whatever's next, 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 all the way down. But if I take the time to step away from her hair, I'm going to take her off the stand, step away from her hair and spin her around and look at her from all different angles. What is the difference that you see when I do this versus when I'm doing this? What do you think I would do differently as a result of stepping back and looking at her from a different perspective? Anybody want to take a stab at it? I have another guest that wants to come in. The dog is banging on the door. You want to come in? How are you going about that side? Yeah. Sorry about that. Dog wanted to go outside. Um, so Oh, can't see or hear anything. That's not good. Is that everyone? Can nobody hear me or is that just Anne? Let me know in the chat if you cannot see me That's not good. or hear me. That's not good. So yes, Tammy said, see where the dark is. Um, Kayla said, add low lights for dimension. Um, where did that other comment go? Kayla said, where it's too bright, more dimension. So yes, more dimension. What happens is the hair will tell you and show you what it needs. And any kind of swirly, swirly, whirly calyx, like she's separating right here. By, by stepping back and kind of putting my fingers through her hair, I can see that that's an area that she's always going to split. And she's a doll head. So, you know, imagine a human, how many calyx and swirls they have. So I can make sure that my placement accounts for that separation and that swirl so that I can foil both sides of that calic instead of being in that shooting out of a nail gun, like boom, 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 horizontal foils all the way up. Because what happens with horizontal placement is horizontal results in sheets of color, you know, lots of solid color over top of any depth that you have. And in my opinion, and what my experience has been with highlighting is the, the blonde is only as special as the depth that's behind it. So when we get in this autopilot 
next piece, next piece, next piece. And we get in, in another autopilot of every single piece has to be a highlight. Every single piece has to be roots to ends. Every single piece has to be in a certain you know, order and place on the head. And that's simply not true. So if you want to level up your foiling and you want to be known as the go-to person in your area, do something that simple. Step back away from your client and really see what they need. And for, you know, don't, don't go it, get into the habit either of saying, what would you like to have? Because our clients are always going to ask for more, 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 you know, give me, give me the most amount possible. But clients don't understand that the depth needs to be there to pop the blonde. So when we bring them into the conversation and say, you know, what are you thinking today? And blah, 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 blah. No, you take charge and say, so I see that, you know, you've, your highlights have grown out quite a bit, um, but I also know how you wear your hair. So when we look at her, she is, with the exception of a couple little angles in the front, she's pretty much one length hair. So I could spend two and a half to three hours foiling her to make sure that every single hair back here is blonde. And who is ever going to see it? You saw she came to me with her ponytail was low and, and down the back like this. So all of that lightness is going to show only on the top anyway. So I think most of us run out of gas our energy is depleted by the time we get to the crown of the head because we're being so meticulous in the back going through and picking out all these little tiny itty bitty, whatever you want to call them, tinsel lights, baby lights, you know, everybody has these different names, but in the end it's just foiling and spending all that time underneath when this is what your client's going to do when she's, when you're done her blowout, this is what you see, right? She does the front judge. She may go like this to check out her front hairline. I have been doing hair for, you know, over 35 years. I have never, ever seen a client go like this and check their color underneath. I've seen them do this to make sure that the underneath here is taken care of, but I've never seen them root through and look to see if that whole area underneath the occipital is completely blonde underneath. Because here's the deal too. You've heard me complain recently that my hair won't hold a curl because it needs to be cut so bad and it got really heavily, heavily highlighted and now it won't hold a curl. So what I gained in blonde, I lost in style and it's driving me crazy. It's I, I don't know that I would do it again because it's easy for me to just put the beach girls in my hair and just go. And now I'm curling and curling and curling and it's just, just falling flat. It can't hold a curl. So knowing your client's needs and knowing what is more important to them as far as their blonding and giving them everything where they see it. You know, what our clients do is they wash their hair. As soon as you're finished doing their, their, um, their hair, they go home and that night they wash their face and they may pull their hair back with, I pull my hair back with a hairband to wash my hair. So they're going to notice the front hairline. So I would rather see you spend way more time in this front area where she's going to be looking at it over and over and over again than all that time in the back. I also want you to be um, not so reliant on low lights. This is what happens when you're, if you find yourself low lighting quite a bit, it's because you're highlighting too much, too much, too close together, too many, all of those things. Less is always more. So when you go to retouch her, if you get into that, you know, um, autopilot, boom, 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 foils everywhere, she's going to need to come in in six, seven weeks. In my opinion, a highlight is not done in six weeks. That's a retouch, a single process retouch. So if you're foiling people every six weeks, you're doing way too much work. It's too much for the client, you know, um, Budget wise, it's too much for you to have them in there every seven weeks getting foils because you know what it's like to retouch someone who's only been out seven weeks. You're trying to meticulously touch up just what has grown in and not overlap on those foils. So, you know, a lot of times they're coming to you because the calendar says that they need to come or 
because you have over highlighted them so much that they absolutely need to come because now they have that zipper telltale root um, in the regrowth area where it looks like black and white and they're miserable because they're so overly blonded that Valerie says, I'm an over highlighter. Most of us are Valerie because we were never taught this until Beth pointed that out to me to step back and really see what the hair needs, you know, step back and look and say, like, when I look at her, she's looking a little bit too solid in the ends in this area in the front. So I would look at that if I step back and said, oh, wow, that doesn't even look like highlights anymore. That looks like solid coverage. I would step back and say, let me pop, you know, some dimension in there and pop a low light behind her money piece to make that money piece pop again. You also don't want to think that every low light has to be roots to ends. There's a lot of intention involved in low lighting. And I go into this in depth in my Hair Color Secrets Insider membership. There's not only a highlight and a low light, there's something I call a mid light. So you don't have to go high, high or low, low. There are a lot of areas in between. And I do a technique that makes fine hair appear so much thicker than it is because of the stepping back, the placement, the intentional dimension that's done with three different shades of color. So step up your game and be unique and care what's going on in that head. Yes, it's so easy <clears throat> to go in, <clears throat> excuse me, to go in and just foil on autopilot, bring everything up to pale yellow, ready to crack off the head and throw a glaze on it. Yes, that's easy, <clears throat> but it's not special. It's not, you know, something that would stand out. Like I want your client when she leaves you and stops at Starbucks on her way home, I want three people to stop her and ask her where she got her hair done. Because what I see every single day in Facebook forums, not my groups, but other groups that I'm in, <clears throat> what I see every day is help. I need more clients. How can I get more clients? To which I say, stop worrying about getting more clients Worry about up-leveling your game as a colorist and a cutter and be so good at what you do that you never even have to step away from your chair to think about a new client coming in because every one of the clients that leave you are such a billboard advertisement for free that when you hand them a referral card and they walk out of there, <clears throat> I want to quote, sorry, this is leftover sickness and I know it's annoying. Hold on. I recently <clears throat> interviewed John DeJulius again, who I love. And he talked about giving your clients the bounce. He said, he said you want to have the bounce effect. I was like, what's that? I want to bounce. He said, you want your client to feel so amazing when they're leaving your salon that they have that bouncy walk. Did you ever notice the difference when a client's feeling themselves and they keep catching themselves in another mirror and they're on their way out and they're touching up their lipstick and they're zhuzhing their hair and they're in the bathroom for way too long before they leave. That's the bounce. So they have a new bounce and a new pep in their step because they're feeling great. Their hair feels great. They feel like they, you know, look five years younger and they're just ready to go out and conquer the world. That's the bounce. So if you don't see people having the bounce when they're leaving, if you see them doing like the more of the angry 11 eyebrow when they're looking in the mirror, like making this face, it's time for you to up your game. So stop looking for new clients. Stop trying to figure out why you're not retaining your clients. It's that you're not doing a good enough job. There's no easy way to, to sugarcoat that. If they're not coming back, there's a reason they're not coming back. And a lot of them won't tell you what it is. It could be that you make them wait 30 minutes every single time they come to you. They're not going to put up with that for very long, especially now when there's so much more competition out there. And everybody's fighting for the same clients. Think about yourself, the reason that you would ever leave someone to get your hair done by someone else. Like for me, I moved. I moved to another state. So I was forced to go to someone else. Guess what? I'm going home tomorrow to Philadelphia. I'm getting my hair done. Like any chance I have to get my hair done with the people that I was more comfortable with at home, I'm going to take it. But I was forced to have someone new do my hair because I moved. And it was not easy to find people here in Florida. It took me 
pretty much the first two and a half years of disasters to find someone. So a client's not going to leave to come to you for $5 off or, you know, all these promotions that I see where people think they're rocking people's world saying, well, I did a promotion for $5 off. I'm sorry. I wouldn't leave my coffee shop to save $5. Like people have their routine. They have their person. So you have to do something very uniquely different that gets their attention so that they go into work tomorrow and there's someone, you know, at the coffee station at work that looks different today. And they're going to talk to them and say, oh my gosh, what did you do differently? You look amazing. And they say, you know, oh, I, I my hairdresser just got back from this show and she did this new technique. The first thing your, your client is going to say to that person is, oh my gosh, can I get their number? They're not going to come to you with a picture of that friend from work on their phone and say, can you do this? Because we talked about last week, you fell asleep at the wheel and you didn't recommend that they get some tip outs in the bottom of their hair or some face framing sparkle lights or the new Scandi blonde. I don't know if you've seen the Scandinavian blonde technique that's all over Instagram and TikTok. This old lady is up on all the trends. I see it all. Not sure I'm going to be doing that anytime soon because here's the problem with TikTok and Instagram. People show these great techniques but they're not sharing you the why, the how, and the when behind it. So you're going to do this Scandi technique on your Latino client who's level four. What do you think is going to happen? She's going to have an orange ring around the rosy and look like Blondel McDonald. The Scandi technique is just that. Scandi is short for Scandinavian. Scandinavian women are gorgeous, level eight and above from God or whoever you believe in. They were born with level eight, nine hair. So the Scandi technique is taking that first row of the hair and paint, they paint the lightener literally on the client's face. They paint the lightener on their, on their face, on their scalp. And then they bring this first row of hair down onto it just at the root area. So it's basically when they pull their hair back, their whole entire hairline will be blonde with no little dark baby hairs in between. So there's a time and a place for it. Absolutely. It's a cool, fun, new trend. But I promise you there's going to be a lot of disasters with people being uninformed and not knowing the whole story that it's supposed to be on level seven and lighter. And they're going to try to do it on <clears throat> level six hair. I mean, on level five, four, three hair. And it's going to be orange. So Always, always, always seek out education, whether it's from me or someone else, it needs to be happening. You can't be in a bubble. The, one of the best lines <clears throat> that I've heard is from my, my coach who I love. Um, she often refers to the statement that, you know, when you're trying to make a decision, you're in your own head, you're in your own experience and you bring to the decision whatever experience you've had in your life and you can't shake that. That comes with you wherever you are. And the way that she explains it is, you know, the reason you need a coach, the reason you need a mentor, the reason you need outside validation is because you, when you're inside of a jar, you can't read the label. So the labels on the outside of the jar, you're inside the jar, you can't read what's on the label. So you don't even know where you are because you're in a jar that's labeled, but you don't know what it is. And I was like, wow, that's really insightful because it's so true. Sometimes you just can't see things because you're too close. Another example is how we started today. You're too close. You're like this on the head and you're just seeing what's right here. What's right at that surface level. You're not separating it, looking through it and seeing what the hair is trying to tell you that, you know, this is all very solid and way too light. And then this underneath is way too dark. So if you step back and you start to pop in some diagonals, that's a whole other coffee chat, but diagonal placement is one of my favorites because it covers a lot of territory. When you go diagonally, I'm taking a highlight from all the way up here to all the way down here in one foil. And I always do long hair with my extra long foils. So I have a lot more surface to cover and I don't have to worry about going around curves on the head. So if you have a lot of bleeding, sliding, slipping foils, that's what's happening. You're trying to go around corners and foil is not round. The foil uh, surface is straight. So if you try to go around a corner, especially here 
on the hairline, you're going to get buckling, bleeding, sliding, and, um, you know, bleeders on the scalp, and you're going to get a result that you don't like, and then you're going to have a correction on your hands. Vessi said, it's the wine chat for me. I'm in Bulgaria. That's so cool. Welcome, Bulgaria. I've never heard very many things about Bulgaria. Do I want to go there? Tell me what's fabulous about Bulgaria. Welcome to the chat. And Carolyn says she's Scandinavian. That's interesting. So you were always a really pale blonde and you made yourself a redhead. I love that. <clears throat> Donna said such an excellent coaching in these coffee chats and even more attention in your membership. Thank you, Donna. Um, what else do we have here? I would do at least two sections on the back diagonal because I hate seeing ponytails with two color on the top with highlights. But yeah, you always want to take care. This underneath... I consider part of the money piece. So if you're doing money piece, money piece, money piece, and you just keep touching up up here, you have to address under here because when the hair all falls forward, that's all part of the money piece. So even if they just get a face frame, the face frame includes all of this all the way down to the bottom. So that's an extra, extra tip thrown in. Thanks to, is it Tam Tammy? Tammy? I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. I'll show Show your name on here, Tammy. Blend everything. Um, this one. I would do at least two sections on the back diagonal because I hate seeing posts. So a lot of people, what she's saying is a lot of people keep doing partial, 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 and they never, ever do the underneath. I'm not saying to do that. What I'm saying is most people do the entire retouch through the entire head from underneath hairline all the way up the back to the crown all the way up the sides all the way through the mohawk the entire head every single visit and it's just too much it's not necessary um, it's expensive for the client it's labor intensive for you um, and just not necessary nelly i'm so proud of you you're on here nelly is my tech challenged pet in our membership she always have te has tech issues we were chatting yesterday trying to get her on her her platform. <laughs> so I'm glad that you're here live. I'm glad you found it. <laughs> um, Carrie said, I always look at my client's eye level. I love that because that's a whole other conversation with consultation. You want to look your client in the eye, not through the mirror. So thank you for pointing that out. That's very, very true. Um, and it really makes the emotional connection much stronger when you talk to your client, looking at them and not through the mirror. So many of us are guilty you know, especially speaking of Instagram and TikTok, I see everyone doing the entire consultation, doing this. The keep, let me raise her again. I don't know if it's a nervous thing when they're talking to the client, but they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do some foils. We can do it around your face. We can do that. They're doing this the whole time that they're talking to the client with the consultation. And it could be an avoidance thing, a distraction because they don't want to make eye contact, but that doesn't feel as special as if I'm sitting eye level with her. I'm sitting, she's sitting, and I can touch her hair once if I need to get it away from her face like I am now, but me constantly, the whole time I'm talking to her going like this, it's just going to make the client feel uncomfortable. Most people, especially post-COVID, most people don't want to be touched unnecessarily. And if you don't ask for permission to touch them, you can see them kind of flinch because we don't know what kind of trauma people have had in their lives. Um, if Bryn's still on here, she's probably laughing right now because she taught me that. She managed a yoga studio and she took trauma training and learned all of that. Like you can't just walk up, like I'm a, I'm a hugger and a toucher. So I was at her yoga studio and I like touched this strange guy like just kind of slapped him on the arm and said something. And she's like, mom, you can't do that. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you can't just touch someone like that. You don't know him. And I'm like, I know, but it was just on his arm. She's like, I know, but you don't know what their story is, what their history is. So I, I found that to be interesting. And my friend Donna also pointed out to me, she, I touched one of her girls. Um, we were at a hair class and one of the girls that worked with her was sitting in front of me and I, I touched the back of her hair and said, Oh, I love your hair. And she did one of these, like, she didn't like that. And I was like, oh my God, she's really uptight. And Donna's like, well, you know, my, you're a hairdresser, so you don't think anything of it, but a lot of people don't want to be touched by strangers. Danielle, you are a space invader. I am definitely a space invader and I plan to hug you when I see you. <laughs> we need more hugs in this world. I won't apologize for it. I am a hugger and I will go to my grave as a hugger. 
Um, but now I ask, I say, okay, to give you a hug. Can we hug? You know, I'll say that really quickly because I want to make sure that it's okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so be special, step back from your clients, change up your placement, make sure that you really understand what it is you're putting into the hair and the why behind it. Why is that next foil going in? I want you to promise me today or tomorrow, whenever you're going back to the salon, that you're going to look at that head completely differently as a result of seeing this coffee chat today. And then I want you to promise me that you're going to share it <clears throat> with at least two people. So tag a friend. You can type their name at whatever. This is an open group. They don't have to sign up or prove that they're a hairdresser to be in here. So share this group with a friend. Um, I think we're just a little over 10,000 people on here now. So I want to reach as many hairstylists as possible because my goal is for all of us to reach that six figure level in our careers because we've given our entire bodies and souls to what we do behind the chair. And every single one of you deserves to be paid for that. So these little small changes add up to big things and enable you to raise your prices to, you know, seek out those perfect fit clients that are your ultimate avatar client that are, are a fit for what you like to do. Don't fill your chair with, you know, $10 kids haircuts just because you want a body in your chair. Be intentional about who you have in your chair and create the business of your dreams. It's really not hard. So I'm here for you as a mentor. Reach out if you need more color education. Check out my YouTube channel. Check out my podcast, Ask the Color Expert. Please leave a review. Um, and I will see you all on the next one. Thanks for watching.